Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for coming to the third day of this international uh, neurosurgery webinar course or conference. In fact, we have had uh, free papers and uh, uh, lectures from esteemed uh, neurosurgeons from around the world. Uh, today, we have another very uh, packed as well as a, a fantastic program. Uh, and this is our final day. And the first speaker is uh, Professor um, Maximilian Macdon. He's a great friend of the LISERV, uh, but uh, he was the pro professor and chairman of the prestigious Department of Neurosurgery in Kiel, and he's an emeritus professor there. Professor there. He has been active in neurosurgery um, throughout his career until now, and uh, he is a great friend of uh, uh, many countries. Uh, he's, a, he's a very internationalist as, I, as, as anyone as I know. And uh, he is a, like all German professors, they are master surgeons in every area, but he uh, has a particular interest in functional neurosurgery. So Professor Magdon is uh, going to uh, talk to us about uh, deep brain stimulation and we are, we are now. Uh, thank you very much, Professor. Thank you, Nari, for this kind of introduction and thank you for inviting me again. It's my great pleasure to be with this course and I've been very, very much impressed about what you have put on for the two days and uh, I wish you all the best for this day and for the next days also to the audience. So I want to talk a little bit about deep brain stimulation and uh, for Parkinson's disease mainly. And uh, if, since there are many residents obviously here, I would like to make a little point, personal point. There are prerequisites for functional neurosurgeon, which also are true for general neurosurgeon, but particularly for a functional neurosurgeon, I think we have a lot of modern technologies developing over the recent years, which are fascinating. And one has to be very much impressed about them. They want to have to learn and improve them, but still with all the technology which is offered, which can be developed, which is offered by the industry, we as neurosurgeons have to be modest. We need a team approach and uh, everyone is involved in the, in the treatment, but there needs to be a leader, someone who has really to take the responsibility. And when we talk to the patient, you have to be honest. You teach your patients, talk to them what you, would, what you can offer to them but you also have to learn from your patients. That's also very, very important. And you have to learn to go abroad for meetings and learn from uh, other colleagues. And when you start uh, doing a functional neurosurgery, every case, or if you want to go into a career with, neuros with uh, functional neurosurgery, you have to be very careful and slow and better think twice than think too fast. And since it's an evolving field, you have to let others do the mistakes, think about it, think of other possibilities as well, like uh, stimulation versus lesioning. Every, everyone is talking about lesioning nowadays, but you have to also think about stimulation and particularly uh, depending on the countries where you're located. <clears throat> so we have to see both possibilities. Neurosurgical therapy of movement disorders has a long career, more than 70 years now, Myers. He started with a surgical disruption of these fibers, which influence rigor and tremor. And everything really started with Spiegel and Weiss's developing the stereoencephalotum back in 1947, like Seltara and many other from other countries, Sweden, uh, France, uh, Japan, Germany, and again, France. So this is the first system which has been developed by Spiegel and Weiss's many years ago. This has certainly been refined, but that's a basic. So there were many, many stereotactic operations performed, which were lesions, but they taught us a lot. They taught us very much about the functional anatomy of the basal ganglia area. And all of a sudden there was a development of L-DOPA and the agonists and other medications came in too. So there was a breakdown in stereotactic surgery, which uh, then recovered when deeper and simulation, another technology was developed in the 80s, early 80s, and then really got off in the mid, mid 80s, early 90s, and further on. So it's a long development. Spiegel and Weiss's, they developed the stereoencephalotum. You see Henry Weiss's here in this picture, and everything was on the basal ganglia surgery. So everything was very close to the third ventricle, uh, the lateral ventricle, but to the third ventricle for Robert of Monroe and all the other things. They were 
the ventricles were filled initially with air or with the contrast medium, mostly with air. And from there, they calculated very carefully the, the situation where the basal ganglia were located. So neurosurgical therapy of movement disorders started with destruction. Now there are rare indications uh, when it is not possible to perform uh, stimulation procedures, but uh, nowadays coming back again as controlled lesion with a high focus ultrasound, for example. Stimulation is a method of choice presently. And then we have other possibilities also, which came up with augmentation, stem cell injections and other factor injections. And one has to be very much it's, it's still a moving field, so there's going to be methods of the futures. Target points are in the basal ganglia, VAM, GPI, globus pallidus internus, subthalamic nucleus, which is the working horse, no, horse nowadays for neurosurgeons and sooner and theater close to the uh, STN or target fibers between the nuclei. So uh, we have the points, we have the fibers, and we have to be very careful what we see when we perform stimulation, when we think about doing what kind of surgery. Someone who is always credited, that's Professor Benabit, who was a good friend of mine from Grenoble, who was very active in the field. There was also many, many others before him and parallel to him, like Professor Siegfried from Zurich, I was whom I've been working back in 73 when I started my neurosurgery career in, in Zurich uh, with Professor Yashagil and that's me when I was still young and that's one of my uh, colleagues. So, uh, we know that from the, from the epidemiology, with increasing age, we have an increasing risk and cumulative incidences in this aging population of developing Parkinson's disease, Parkinson's, and uh, so also the interest for these uh, brain stimulation techniques have increased over recent years. As you see here, that's a curve for deep brain stimulation from a paper from Cabrera. 2014 has even overtaken a number of publications for transcranial magnetic stimulation with us. So there are a couple of techniques, DBS, TMS, and direct cortical stimulation as well. DBS publications as uh, summarized by Lozani and Lozano and Lipner a couple of years ago started in the 80s. And then there came many trials like STN, DBS, and Yuma used to treat Parkinson's was allowed and then came the improvement of the FDA for DBS and essential tremor and Tourette syndrome. And then for Parkinson's only DBS for approval. And then dystonia. So a couple of uh, trials and depression, others, other indications came depression, Alzheimer's disease and so on. So there's still evolving technology, it's evolving indication that we have to be very, very careful to what to talk, talk to the patients and what to suggest to them and uh, take the entire patient, also take the family into consideration when you want to do something. Now DBS for Parkinson's disease, that's one of the slides which one of my former uh, students, now Professor Hamel from, from Hamburg gave to me, 2019 is the most investigated therapy for Parkinson's disease. However, he says there's no increase in efficacy in the last 20 years. So we have to improve on this. Increase in efficacy should not be expected. Limitations of the deep brain simulation persist, which is a kind of uh, realistic, maybe a little bit pessimistic uh, perspective. But in hand, we can enhance the therapy when we try to avoid the complications and the adverse events. So very much about this. These are the basics here. The basal ganglia area, you see the capsular interna, you see the basal ganglia and close to the third ventricle, to the lateral ventricles, that's the area which we like to target. And everything is uh, explained, well explained by the DeLong uh, theory, the normal state of the interaction between the cerebral cortex, the striatum, globus pallidus externus, uh, <coughs> globus pallidus internus, uh, SDN, and the thalamus. So we have exit territory, inhibitory, and modulary uh, modulatory pathways which interact in a normal state. And then in the Parkinsonian state, we have more inhibition from the striatum to the GPE. We have more inhibition from the GPI to the thalamus and we interact and more excitation between the uh, STN and the GPI. So we, uh, this can also be uh, shown differently. We have this motor circuit for Parkinson's dystonia you see this part of the area is the same anatomy. And then we have a 
the limbic circuit, which is very much intermingled with the motor circuit, as you see here, Tourette syndrome, both and OCD depression. And we are only talking about Parkinson's disease. So the 3D anatomy of the basal ganglia is taken from YouTube. You see everything is centered around the ventricular system. So we have to start with the ventricular system. Everything is based on the, on the line between the anterior and the posterior commissure. And the coordinates of the targets based on the mid ACPC line are the, for the thalamic nucleus, which is the main target, which is the working horse, as I mentioned, for Parkinson's. These are in the literature. And then we have the GPI. They are fixed, but I'll show you some modifications as well. And we have the GPI, which is the working horse for dystonia and then the ventromedialis nucleus for tremor. And these are, these are not necessarily only dystonia, dystonia, but also for dystonic components of Morbus Parkinson. We could discuss whether we should go to the SGN regular or go to the GPI. So both options are possible, similar for the nucleus ventralis intermedius for the tremor. So again, the ACPC line as shown on the standard MRI scan and the mid ACPC and from there we go for these targets. And that's where we would like to put our electrodes medial to the capsular interna in this area here somewhere down to the STN or GPI and so we have modifications of this. From our series, we have done now more than 1000 patients over the last 20 years, so we have a summary. Uh, with 760 patients, we, as you see, and the, the numbers have not changed dramatically or the percentage has not changed. Majority of those patients have been treated with, uh, for Parkinson's disease, some uh, 126 for dystonia, essential tremor, and, and the rare indications like myoclonia, sunk, and with so others. So I'll talk mostly about Parkinson's. Inclusion criteria for Parkinson's uh, patients for deeper and simulation. It should be the idiopathic uh, Parkinson's disease, which is conservatively treated, which has uh, leads to a poor quality of life with all the medication. And if the patients have to take uh, all these medications with rebound phenomena, and then they come and say, well, is there something better we can get from treatment? So they undergo neurological evaluation, optimization of the treatment. They still have a poor quality of life, and then they get this DOPA test with neurology, positive L-DOPA test, predicts the chance of recovery of their quality of life, of their movements, uh, which can be expected from surgery approximately. And they have to be in good general health. So a very old man, a very old lady, which has a poor medical health, severe brain atrophy, macroangiopathy, dementia, severe frontal lobe dysfunction and so on, severe uncontrollable internal diseases, heart disease, all the other things, or anticoagulant therapy, immune suppressions. These are no candidates for surgery. And what is also very important, depending on where you are located, if you have uh, no good follow-up possibilities for the patient, so if the patient lives in distant rural areas, that's certainly a rather contraindication against these uh, fascinating technologies of deep brain stimulation because they need a very close look up also further down the career. It's very important to tell the patients it's better sometimes to perform just the lesioning in these patients instead of thinking about deep brain stimulation if you cannot follow the patient very well and, and so you have to take the responsibility for the patient. It's very important to explain this to him or to her. So the clinical DBS effect can be multifactorial. We have, we have these nuclei, we, so we put in a, a, an electrode and we get everything, into, we get some interaction with the soma, with the dendrites, with the axon, and this needs to be worked out to depend on the physical properties and uh, conductivity and all the things of this uh, brain tissue around this. McIntyre here has shown nicely you see that's the STN. We have some effect in the STN itself, but we also have other effects in the areas around. So it's, uh, it's not always a regular uh, bulb shaped uh, effectivity, but it's always somehow distorted. And we have to think how to improve this. 
I chose the, the Schaltenbrand Warren Atlas as a basis uh, with the coronal section. We there are also up other atlases like the Montreal Neurological Institute, which is an electronic atlas nowadays created. And you see from publications uh, from 2017, they are a probabilistic conversion of these electrodes in the SGN for Parkinson's patients for dystonia in other areas between the GPI and GPE and essential tremor. So there are modifications of this. Uh, of these uh, electrode positions uh, collected from various patients, from huge uh, numbers of patients, and to, to make positioning of the electrodes easier and also to better understand what the effect of the stimulation could be preoperative, but also afterwards what happened to these patients. Because one always has to be aware that the, we have structural connectivities between like the STN, for example, or <clears throat> as you see here, we have a motor part in anterior, we have a door, uh, and, and we have a limbic part of the STN of the subthalamic nucleus. So we have to be aware where other, other effects occur when we stimulate down in the basal ganglia. That's very important. So when we want to have the indication, we have to ask the right question, define the clinical situation, what are the deficits, what are the problems and where do they come from? This is usually done by neurology. And then you, we talk together with neurology and neurosurgery, whether we can improve by doing deeper in simulation. We have to find the right targets to simulate. We started with the nuclei. Now we think also about the interactions between various nuclei. So we go from nuclei to fibers. And then we have to perform the right stimulation to discuss when to perform surgery. So at which stage of the disease, we can do it very, very early nowadays, but uh, we it's always have to discuss with the patient. He has to take the burden of his further life uh, with some battery, with some implants in there, whether he really would like to have this. So it's a long discussion and we need to be caref very careful about uh, putting the risk or the burden of uh, implants onto the patient. That's a benefit, but it's also, it's a burden also for the patient sometimes. I'll show you later pictures. So cooperation between neurology and your surgery is very important. And then we have the instruments. We have to design the electrodes, the cooperation between your surgery industry. And then we have the parameters, simulation parameters. And at the moment, many people are talking about closed circuits for Parkinson's disease as has been developed for epilepsy, for example. How to find the right target, clinical diagnosis, the leading symptoms, it's very simple. We go for the STN because we know it's a very small nuclei which we can target very, very carefully. We use uh, MRI with special sequences. We define the target according to coordinates, which are modified according to anatomy of the vessel. And the ventricles, we go with the Ben's gun, ben, uh, Benabit's gun, three to five trajectories we go down. Uh, to do with a microelectrode recording. That's our technology, that's our technique, uh, which has been disputed. We still rely to it. We one to three to five trajectories. And when we go upward with the microelectrode, we stimulate that through the microelectrodes and define the best stimulation site. And then we place the electrode down at this area and again uh, test the effect of the microelectrode, which is carefully fixed to the skull. And then we and I, when you look at these uh, <coughs> figures, there was a uh, once at an expert meeting, he asked the experts where would they would where they would uh, where they would place their electrodes. And you see that a large variability here in the STN. Most of them, obviously, we would place them in the dorsal part, just in the motor part of the STN. But there are also variations about this. So. They are, you have to be very careful about when you listen, we have these standards electrodes, but that's not really so true. We have done about 50 patients a year, 50 to 70 patients. Sometimes we started, as I mentioned in 99, very, very carefully. And then uh, young people took over and they're still doing a lot of deeper brain simulations. So data acquisition is done in the other, usually we have done it under general anesthesia to have the patient move, moving free to have really good, uh, good MRI scans and 
with the various techniques, various sequences. So we can define the SGN very carefully here. We do, can define the trajectory also on the contrast to be sure that we are out lateral from the, from the ventricle, that we don't touch any, any vessels here, superficial or even deep ones to prevent postoperative hemorrhage or so. And on the basis of the ACPC line, which is nicely shown here, we can see, we can then define the targets and go for deep burn stimulation. Again, ACPC, as you can see here, which I had shown you in the model. So we have targets which are visible in the MRI scan, like the STN. You see that from the, from the uh, coloring, and then we have the GPI where we can use the optic track here again as uh, landmark in the coronal section, which and then we have the nuclear VIM, we have the stereotactic coordinates and uh, <coughs> go further. So microelectrode recording long time ago, one of our first patients in 99 or to early 2000. So we have this old system, homemade system. Now we have Leadpoint and other companies also from, from Atronic, other companies have similar systems or with a stereotactic frame. We use the ZD frame, which we also use for stereotactic biopsies as very helpful. We can define the borders of the STN by the, as you see here, that's the STN, STN, STN with this irregular burst like discharges and high background noise. So it's very typical when you listen to it under the, under the, when you underpass and then we, then we see how long we can go through the STN or like this one. And then again, we listen very carefully when we go through the STN, the substance that I got has a different, has a tonic regular discharge pattern. We know we are through the STN. So then we go back and stimulate where we would like to have the best placement of the electrode. So it's very important to have a very good uh, positioning as good as possible positioning of the electrode because we have this motor area and we have this limbic part of the thalamic nucleus, which obviously does not lie completely free in the brain, but we have areas which are important also. When we are too dorsal, we have the aggressive behavior, interrupted simulation of the triangle of Sano, or we have the impression of anxiety when we go to the substance niger, or when we go to the limbic, we have compulsion. And, uh, and then we also have psychiatric side effects like ir irresistible laughing possibility. So these uh, are the optimal contact areas. And when we go further, when we have gone through, we have many options for the neurologist to stimulate light on the traditional quadripolar electrode or metronic like 30, 30, 3389, we have the possibility to stimulate like this. So it's a simple, uh, simple setup in neurosurgery and with its uh, look through, we have a close cooperation with neurologists when they perform the testing also, as you can see here, and here I'm doing surgery myself, but it's always better to have uh, four neurosurgical eyes because it's possible to make some mistakes and also for learning and controlling each other, it's good to have a four eye principle if it's possible to do it. So it uh, helps them. Postoperative stereotactic uh, X-ray show the nice placement of the electrodes, which is obviously not mandatory. And then we can correlate the electrode placement to a stereotactic atlas, just only to verify that we are really where we wanted to go. So after deep brain stimulation, we have slow change of medication versus stimulation battery exchange after a few years. And then care of patients is very important. Long-term care is not only neurology, but also neurosurgery. We know that DBS suppresses the coronal symptoms of Parkinson's, prolongs the duration of on phases, improves quality of life, allows reduction of medical therapy and side effects. And like I uh, what now should, should, should work, I should show you some pictures, some of videos, a patient with a, uh, with a akinetic, uh, Parkinson, so the akinesia component was uh, very severe in this patient. She had difficulties moving, really moving her fist. And uh, look at her, how she stands like this. It's very, very difficult. She, so she has a high risk of falling and hopefully it works uh, for the next. So when I go here for this. So you see after the operation, she's 
still not on stimulation, stim off. So there has been a placement effect which lasts for some time. So these, some kind of lesioning has occurred. And when you look at how she moves her uh, legs, oh, she should do that now. And then she tries to get up. She gets up quite well already. And she's much better off now than before surgery. Okay, and then we have the uh, stim on effect. Uh, wait a second. No. So she's much better on now with the finger tapping. And you'll see also when she's going to walk. So it has been one of our very early patients back in 99. <clears throat> So akinesia has dramatically improved, which is very helpful for her daily life. And she is much better able now to walk, stand, get up and, and walk as you can see. And when you compare how she was uh, unable to control her movement, it's much better now. Okay, so this summarizes in uh, quality of life improvement. And we have done this early STEM study, which has been published back in 2013. So we see the dramatic improvement of the Parkinson's disease quality of life, 39. Summary index, 26%, even in patients who had uh, improved completely optimized medical therapy. So we have improvement of these uh, by 20, uh, 26%, which is dramatic for the quality of life. You see PDQ summary, 26%. Mobility activities of daily living have dramatically improved as well as emotional well-being and stigma. Body discomfort to slight cognition has not really improved. There has been also some, uh, not so much uh, communication has not improved either. What one has to be very much aware about the serious adverse events in the neurostimulation group. There were two suicides, life-threatening events in, in 14 related to medication or stimulation worsening of mobility. And these are the, the, the official figures in this publication. When one listens to the talks by my very good friend, Dr. Marvan Harris, who recently also gave his talk on ethics on deep brain stimulation, one wonders whether these figures are really true, whether these are the only one figures or whether they are higher complications or serious adverse events. And one has to read through those articles very carefully and to understand everything also behind the lines maybe. So other possibilities are frame-based or non-frame-based. That's a discussion. We usually use the frame-based. Uh, there is a clear point system brought out by the industry when you can work in the, within the MRI scan and perform immediate control of how you place the electrodes with this pivot point area. There are other improvements at the standard electrode, as you can see here, the quadra, quadripolar metronic electrode. We have worked with one uh, company to improve uh, steering the field by multiple electrodes, like here, 64 electrodes steering the field so that one targets only the STN and not the areas around, like here, the capsule antenna, for example. And this gives uh, additional freedom for the neurologist or the neurosurgeon to better place the electrode and also to better stimulate, but also brought, uh, brings a lot of problems too, because it's a lot of, uh, a lot of stimulation business needs to be done, very caref careful titration of the stimulation effect, and, but uh, maybe very helpful in the future. And from this, there have been a development of many <clears throat> different electrodes. We had the standard electrode, which has, now we have the Aliva electrode, which you see here, it is two, two normal circular electrodes. Uh, and then we have this uh, division into three segments. And there are also variations in Boston Scientific and Jules like this, and that's the other which I talked about. <clears throat> so there are many possibilities. 
to shape the electrical field by this computer technology, which he really has, that's the, the thought. And then it really needs to be applied in human and in patients, that's our computational modeling methods. And, uh, but uh, this here definitely benefits for the patient. We, how can we further optimize the target? We can integrate other, other modalities like fiber tracts into the planning, as you can see here from the Freiburg group a couple of years ago. So to see whether we really hit very close to the, to the perimeter tract, we can visualize it and uh, to try to be aware of it. And we can, with these methods, we can also target other areas as well. We know we can simulate the brain, but it's, it's a network. A certain We can simulate it at certain nodes and we have to have a very careful follow-up of patients for additional effects. Hardware associated complications need to be discussed with the patients before and that's our series. We have 15, 16% of complications in the multiple sclerosis patients. These are the very slim, very, slim, very sick patients. So this is explainable. We have also in Parkinson's about 7%, essential tremor and dystonia slightly less. So that's again from Dr. Hamels, uh, they should be, these uh, complications or adverse events should be based on an analysis on patient years for long-term follow-up. And that's a very busy, uh, busy slide because you put all the complications into current adverse events and you see there's a whole variability of the, of the, of the, from the different series which have been published over the recent 20 years or so. So uh, you can give these uh, numbers to the patient to select where he should go or where he or she should go, but it's better to do a good job and try to be as good as possible and to be as honest as possible. So per patient or per, uh, per from the meta-analysis of uh, 103 publications, hardware removal was necessary per patient year two and a half to 3%. That's quite a number, number and also lead revisions between three and 4%. Now we have from the industry, we've got, these are the big clumsy things, which in the, the uh, IPG, including the battery, they became much slimmer when we have, uh, when they left the battery off and just only put the electrodes in and some recharging possibilities. So is it really good? It needs to be discussed with the patient. That's the initial picture, which many of you certainly know. And then we have 10 years later, we have this wide bed variation. So it's very important, very difficult for neurosurgeons or also for neurologists to stick with, uh, to understand all these different, different systems. We have to stick to one or two systems at maximum really to understand the benefits, the problems of this, and then uh, advise our patients which system they should get very difficult. I skipped this one. Long-term problems, it's very important. One has to take care of these patients because uh, <clears throat> such a, such a electro, such a IPG placed in the uh, right, has a high risk of develop infection. So as soon as there is some problem, the patient should be advised to come to his, see his neurosurgeon, not only stay with his home physician, but go to the neurosurgeon to see whether they should be like here, the, the cables have been have moved somewhere and somehow, and that's the risky area. So the patient risks to leave, to lose his, his uh, IPG and uh, then he may really run into trouble. Open questions remain DBS versus lesioning. This depends on the situation, on the local situation, as I mentioned, when patients are far away from the treating neurosurgeon it's, or neurologist is better to do lesioning because then once you have done the treatment, the patient can be left alone and has done a good job and you have done a good job. Also financial burden in Germany, this costs about 20,000 euros and uh, slightly higher nowadays. Then we need neurology follow-up complications a long course of deeper simulation needs to be taken care of. Discussion about target SGN versus GPI. GPI was the first after the VAM for Parkinson's and then SGN because it's a small target which can be nicely targeted. And then some uh, discussion about awake surgery versus a sleep surgery. We have done Parkinson's, we have done an awake surgery 
dystonia, we've always done it in sleep surgery. So <clears throat> to, we don't need the patient to, and, and there's a higher risk of, uh, of complications when he moves your uh, dystonic movements. So Parkinson's usually we do awake surgery to have cooperation with the patient. It's very, very important. If this is a good message, empty battery, broken hardware, infected hardware, we create a dependency on the system for patients with Parkinson's disease. Once we have implanted this uh, DBS system, this can be life-threatening. Marvin Harris has published about it. We have published about this, about death or high complications after when the patient comes too late with an empty battery or with a broken hardware to the patient. So it's a high risk. Dystonia, we have other possibilities. Post-stroke dystonia, I just only show you one patient before surgery and after surgery, you see before surgery has very bad positioning. And once we just a couple of days after surgery, so, so then we can have very good, good uh, effects of deep brain stimulation in this patient. Obviously it has been a unilateral positioning and uh, Tremor, VIM is again via, uh, awake surgery. And that's a patient with a tremor, thalamic tremor before surgery. He's very slim, as you see, because he has problems eating, drinking. Okay, and then I will just show how it did, how he did after surgery. You see, one week after DBS, steady hand and okay. So the patient can benefit from this kind of surgery. But as I started my talk, modern technologies are fascinating. We still have to be very modest. We have to be very, very honest, learn from our patients and learn from other colleagues. Be careful, think about it before we do some indication, think about other, other possibilities. And uh, depending on this localization where you, where you are located, localized, uh, stimulate or lesion, but be very careful for your patient. Do what you think you can do best. I have to be very careful about ethics of medical practice. The brain, as you can see here on the keel further, we have a shipyard where we build a lot of submarines. The brain is very similar to a submarine. When you just only look at the surface, it looks very nice. If you would like to look very carefully into the submarine, you have to take it out. That is not possible with the brain, obviously, but we can, uh, <clears throat> can have many, many possibilities to evaluate the brain function. Uh, invasively, non-invasively, invasively, and we have to try to do the best for our patient. Thank you very much for your attention. That's about it. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mahdon. It was an uh, uh, excellent uh, lecture, really. I found it very useful. Uh, I don't do functional neurosurgery, uh, and but uh, so, you know, I really understood the whole lecture very well. Uh, first of all, I will open to any questions to the audience. Um, let's see, uh, what do you call? Uh, I think I've got a question from uh, um, uh, Mr. G Giorgio Zilidis. He's uh, finished his uh, fellowship in functional neurosurgery at Ox Oxford. Um, he's asking, uh, what do you think about MRI guided, highly focused ultrasound to create lesions for tremor? Thanks. Well, of course, I could have I could have also included this one in my talk. Uh, that's a very modern technology, but I was uh, asked on to talk only about Parkinson's disease, so sure. I did not include this one in. Sure. Uh, when uh, when I was still chairman of the department, there was a couple of publications coming out from. Uh, they started with a high focused ultrasound uh, in Boston. My Peter Black and, and his group, they started with this together with radiology, Ferenc Joles with GE, and we were very much interested. So at the beginning, these high-focus ultrasounds started with outside of the brain, 
like uh, doing this lesioning, uh, burning away some some uh, no uh, some lumps in the in in the breast, which I would say, and then afterwards having overcome all the problems with the uh, attenuation coefficient and all these things in the in the skull. They also developed this for for brain surgery, and they in the mid 2010s and the second mid part of the of this decade, or last decade, they had uh, published first publications from Korea and others came out. So we are looking also for essential tremor. And, we, and then uh, after I left, my my successor he succeeded in getting one of the machines also to Kiel. And I could have included some some uh, patients in this one from this year, and they seem to have very good effect for for essential tremor because when you go for the VM, you can you can treat these patients non-invasively in the MRI machine. But uh, as I mentioned, I was asked to talk only about uh, about this uh, Parkinson, so I didn't include those. Not a very helpful. Thanks. We have Thank to be aware that uh, the advantage about over simple lesioning is that you can control it with MRI scan. You see how much uh, temperature you apply to what you to about, apply to the nucleus, and then you can really see that you have a good benefit for the patient. You can test him intraoperatively in the machine, as we do also, and you can test it and, and see what is the benefit. And obviously, there's some edema around the lesion which you create. So the effect goes away, but it can be repeated also after some time if necessary. So definitely it's coming out. We have to see what's, whether it is bilaterally. We usually do it only one side in one time. And then the patient would come back for, if he has a bilateral tremor, would come back again another time for the second side. That's an advantage. Thank you, Professor. Just on that, uh, 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 in terms of the, the risk of, hemorrhages with the putting the uh, electrodes in um, uh, in in, uh, in epilepsy surgery they do the contrast enhanced scans and then they plan it is that how now in uh, functional no, we, also, we always we always do the contrast enhanced scan okay. mm -hmm. uh, to see and we also have this diffusion weighted imaging we have done susceptibility weighted imaging and to see whether it's a benefit for the to reduce the number of, of hemorrhage the risk of hemorrhage but uh, when we place a microelectrode, but uh, uh, contrast enhances is as simple as is the best way. Thanks. Uh, I think uh, one of the questions that for the neurosurgeons who are not functional neurosurgery, but we often get asked uh, by friends, family, et cetera, is that uh, if someone has Parkinson's disease and uh, uh, if they are eligible for the uh, deep brain stimulation, uh, how many years does this uh, benefit last for? Uh, and um, I think uh, because most people now think you know once you do it, it's it lasts forever. And uh, but uh, uh, how much does it last for? And um, thank you. Prof. Well, you know, it's a, it's a symptomatic treatment only. So <clears throat> it's a symptomatic treatment, and the Parkinson's disease increases over time. So. When we have this uh, decrease of quality of life of patients, we can improve on their quality of life, but uh, we cannot really completely make uh, stay stable on this on the same level all the time. So we can we can modify slightly by increasing the parameters and so on and so on. But we certainly cannot completely overcome the progression of the disease. But we have now patients who have been living for 10, 15, 20 years maximum. And a couple of them, I have seen them recently at a, at a symposium. A couple of them are still doing quite quite well, but uh, it's a big variation of the of the subject. So we can improve for the first couple of uh, five to ten years, certainly, and this gives a big benefit for them. But we cannot overcome the continuous degradation of the of the system, if you wish. Thanks. Um, well, uh, one more question from me. If any other questions, please. Uh, post it on the uh, chat box and I'll bring you live. Um, I think in Britain, uh, one of the main problem has been uh, the way I see it, it might not be the problem, is that um, historically, the leading figures who have established functional neurosurgery and those centers are quite big. And functional neurosurgery fellows are being produced, but the problem has been because of the expense of the setting up the functional unit, 
uh, and the referrals, patients get referred initially to the neurologist and neurologists tend to refer to the people that he, they have been referring in the past and trying to establish uh, new functional neurosurgery departments really have not really taken off apart from the four units as far as I can know. And uh, how can a new young neurosurgeon actually uh, uh, start a practice? But, um, and also the second part of the question is that and I was very interested in functional neurosurgery, but the department I got my residency didn't do functional neurosurgery. And I knew without actually being part of it for a long time, understanding the brain and everything, it's very difficult to get into functional neurosurgery. So for these two questions, for maybe the first one is for a resident who's working in a department that doesn't have functional neurosurgery. And second, if you have become a, finished a fellowship, how to how to make your practice in a, in a field that are dominated by giants, thanks. Well, you know, it's, uh, I think that's why I mentioned, or uh, that's why I strengthen so much the importance of the uh, team approach. You need a neurologist to work with, at least one neurologist or more neurologists when you are a functional neurosurgeon, if you want to become a functional neurosurgeon with a busy practice. You have to, to know what you do, you, so you have to learn it in a good fellowship program somewhere to stay there for one year or so, and at least and, and see what they are doing, how they do. And be, when you learn doing functional neurosurgery, you have to think whom you are working with in the future. So you have to get these neurologists interested in functional neurosurgery. When I was became chairman in 91 in Kiel, I came also from a department where they, where we had no exposure to functional neurosurgery at all in S and we were, and I was very happy about microsurgery. I thought everything was good. We did not do stereotactic neurosurgery. We started in, neuros in Kiel, we started with stereotactic neurosurgery. And then we got a neurologist who was very much for the Deutschel, who's one of the top movement disorder specialists at this time. And so we said we should start uh, with deep brain stimulation. And we did a lot of training. We went abroad. We spent some time with Ben Abit. We had other people working there and, and coming then to Kiel. So we get a nucleus. We had the idea we should start. And then it took, uh, for, I came to Kiel in 91. Dorsch came to Kiel in 94 or 95. And then in 99 only we did the first surgery. So it takes a long time of preparation and dedication to these uh, technologies if you really want to establish a good practice. Maybe you can do it nowadays, you can do it faster, but uh, don't do it too fast, just do mm -hmm. it, do it right. Thanks. <laughs> Important. And uh, yeah, good cooperation with neurologists and uh, have a good try to get a good balance with neurologists. Thanks. And I, I know in America you have, they have these uh, Parkinson nurses Mm -hmm. These neurosurgeons just put the needle in and say, we have done a good job and uh, the nurse takes care of it afterwards. Uh, I'm not quite sure whether it's really a good, uh, good system. But, Thanks. Uh, uh, Professor, uh, another question for me um, is that, uh, you know, the expense of the functional neurosurgery, the, the deep brain stimulator, and uh, you know, do you see, foresee that it coming down with technology improving and, and what's the hope for the, uh, developing countries, which is you know, even difficult for Britain, Britain, uh, and is it just uh, stimulation for developing con countries? Thanks. Well, you know, I don't think I don't think it would come down. They always say, well, it gets more more difficult and easier to handle and better and everything. So we just need our prices. Mm -hmm. uh, when you have many companies competing, I'm not quite sure how how they make their prices. Like uh, we have been working with the Philips offspring and with this, on this uh, little, on this uh, multi, multi uh, electrode system and uh, improving and wanted to do one, one set. They say, we cannot sell this one because it's too complicated to build and to sell and everything. So, and afterwards they were bought by Medtronic company. Mm -hmm. And uh, now other players like St. Jude's and, and Boston Scientific are sometimes more, they have better engineers, maybe better technicians, better cooperation with neurologists or surgeons than Medtronic maybe for a couple of years. So they may, they are always various players in the field. Like when you look at this uh, business of ventricular shunting, it's, it's very expensive in, in the developed countries, but uh, the so-called poorer countries, brick countries, they have uh, developed their own systems. Mm -hmm. And I wish they would also develop their own systems 
for deeper and simulation, mm -hmm. which would fit their systems. But what about right engineers in India, wherever you, you go, mm -hmm. and they would be able to do so. And is China uh, not have? I know that you are very close to both India as well as China as well as Pakistan, um, uh, and. Um, in, uh, in China, are they still using the European system or do they have the, I, the engineer? Well, I, I, have, I have been in China many, many times. And uh, from what I've seen, they have usually they have used uh, the European or American systems. Yeah, thanks. Maybe Thank they, are, they are also working, they're copying it, but I'm not quite sure about it. Thank you. So before I uh, uh, thank uh, Professor McDonald again, Professor McDonald, uh, you know, your, your foundation, uh, Professor McDonald, could you just uh, let us know about your foundation and well, if you we can have, put your we website? Have made a we have made a foundation, my family, uh, for neurosurgical research and intercultural communication. My wife, she's an interpreter for French and Spanish. And we have three children, so we put some money aside from our money, and uh, we said we should support neurosurgical research, and we should support intercultural communication, like starting with France between Germany and France, and uh, to make exchange to support exchange programs to re exchange uh, support research on different variant topics in neurosurgery, not only in Kiel but in, in Germany and also. Uh, France, we have some applications also from the United States even, and uh, they, these uh, grants, they are small grants only, but uh, it's, it's helping some people to get uh, rapidly, get some money for some, for re some research projects and so on. So it's quite working, working Great. quite well. Thank you, Prof. What's the website? I'll put it on the, on the chat box. Uh, uh, you just look at Medon, Medon Stiftung. I'll send you. I'll send oh, you brilliant. Yeah. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Pro Professor McDonald. That was a fantastic lecture. A lo lot of uh, um, messages on the on the uh, on the chat box on how everyone found it useful. Thank you very much, sir.